Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Wednesday, May 20th, 2015. Today, desperate to shut down the narrative about Seymour Hersh's investigation into the lies surrounding the Osama bin Laden raid, the government has released a trove of documents. That's the word that all the media is echoing, a trove of documents. Some say it's 100, some say it's 200, some say it's 400. It just gets bigger all the time. These documents purport to be Osama bin Laden's library, his reading room. This is the way CNN reports it. They say secret documents provide a portrait of Osama bin Laden. And of course, this is from Peter Bergen, CNN's national security analyst. This is someone who's had a lot of back and forth with Seymour Hersh about the Osama bin Laden raid. And of course, the obvious lies, what might really be lying behind it. But he reports with a straight face exactly what the CIA tells him, that now They've put out these documents after four years. It has you know, no relationship to the investigation of Seymour Hersh. It just happens to come out about a week after all this stuff broke. Uh, and this is being released by none other than James Clapper, director of national intelligence. You remember him? He was the guy that told Ron Wyden there's no mass collection of data, and he couldn't even look at what Wyden, Wyden he was looking down as he was saying that. We also see the Wall Street Journal just repeats this without mentioning Seymour Hersh. They say uh, bin Laden had claimed U.S. was losing the war with al-Qaeda. That's their narrative. Then we see that NPR also parrots it. says U.S. releases documents seized from Osama bin Laden's compound. Yes, it's his entire library. A couple of news media outlets, very few of them, but just a couple, USA Today is one, The Guardian is the other, actually mentioned this might be a reaction to Seymour Hersh's report. Remember that Seymour Hersh's investigative journalism resulted in the church committee hearings that looked at the CIA with a fine-tooth comb. Looked like uh, something was really going to happen with that, but after they got rid of the CIA director, they replaced him with George H.W. Bush, and it was business as usual, perhaps even worse than before. Also, his investigation at the same time that started the church committee hearing in the Senate, there was a Pike committee hearing in the House that committee hearing actually exposed the existence of the NSA and the first exposure of their massive collection of people's phone information without getting a search warrant. All those resulted in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that was supposed to stop this kind of activity. Instead, what the intelligence community did was to use the FISA Act and the FISA Court to get dragnet surveillance of the entire nation, saying, well, we really did go before a judge. No. As Rand Paul points out, you don't get a search warrant for Mr. and Mrs. Verizon. That's essentially what they've done. This is what USA Today says. They say the press release uh, comes four years after the mission that killed Osama bin Laden and allowed commandos to seize letters, books, and other intelligence on the al-Qaeda terror network that he founded. That was something also that Seymour Hersh, according to his sources, said there really wasn't anything taken from there of any significance or volume. They say an interagency review determined that release of the documents and titles to others would not compromise efforts to combat al-Qaeda. The documents were released a week after the article by veteran investigative reporter Seymour Hirsch that quoted an anonymous source saying, quote, there were no garbage bags full of computers and storage devices. The guys just stuffed some books and papers they found in his room in their backpacks. But if you go back and you look at this Wall Street Journal article, it has a picture, just so that you know they've got real documents. What they actually show in this article, let's pull that up on the screen. They actually show the printouts that they got of the English translations of supposedly original documents and letters. Those are nothing but emails that, have, that came from the CIA that they printed out, took pictures of it, and put it on the Wall Street Journal. How's that for journalism? There's your documentary proof. Well, let's take a look at some of the things that are in that reading list. Alex Jones took a look at that earlier today. Folks, Osama bin Laden died in 2002 of kidney failure. We broke it down. We predicted he'd be on ice, rolled out later. They've now admitted the official story's not true. Most of it isn't. No, it was a body double. I've talked to the Navy SEALs. I'm on record when this first got announced, when they blew up their helicopter. And I'm just insulted that I wasn't put in bin Laden's fake reading list. This is clearly to demonize books they don't like. Though I did republish and, and reprint Bloodlines Illuminati for Fritz Springmeier, so I'm proud of that. Uh, the best uh, democracy money can buy by Greg Pallast, frequent guest. The best enemy money can buy by Anthony Sutton, the congressional investigator, how we funded Hitler and Stalin. 
Black Box Voting with Bev Harris. It's uh, just a list of our guests. Bloodlines the Illuminati by Fritz Springmeyer. Confessions of an Economic Hitman, John Perkins, regular guest. Uh, Conspirators Hierarchy, the Committee of 300 by John Coleman. He's former MI6. Is Coleman still around? I wanted to get him on. Uh, Imperial Hubris, uh, we've had that guest on. Um, Project MK Ultra, the CIA's Research Behavioral Modification Program, the actual document. Uh, that's from the Church Committee. The New Pearl Harbor, Disturbing Questions About the Bush Administration, 9-11 by David Ray Griffin. Secrets of the Federal Reserve by Eustace Mullins. He's been a guest before he died. Uh, David Ray Griffin's been, I mean, this is our guest. Where am I in here? I mean, usually when there's some cop killer, they say they did it for me, and then we learn the person was, you know, coming after me or wanted to kill me or hated me. <laughs> I mean, this is just so, or maybe the body double was reading this in his house arrest because it was a body double. You know, half mile or less from the biggest military base in the country. And again, as Alex pointed out, it looks like a reading list from the InfoWars bookstore here, things that you can buy here. Question is, why would Osama bin Laden care about the way the Federal Reserve is ripping off Americans? Uh, there's just a lot of things there that don't make any sense. But of course, they have restated that this is in no way a reaction to the investigative journalism last week by Seymour Hersh. They did this one week after, four years after the purported raid. Now, last night, there was a frontline special on PBS that took a close look at other lies surrounding this and the propaganda surrounding this. Zero Dark Thirty. They took a close look at this. At the time it came out, many people were amazed at the ham-fisted propaganda of Zero Dark Thirty, released just a few days before the re-election of Obama. So the timing as well as the content is questionable. It was bound to be a blockbuster. Oscar-winning director Catherine Bigelow's story of the killing of Osama bin Laden. Well, I think it's um, one of those great mysteries of our time. I think it's one of the great stories of our time. And, you know, these stories come along maybe once, twice a millennium. So it's a pretty compelling story. Behind the scenes, the details of the story were secretly provided to the filmmakers by the Central Intelligence Agency. The CIA's business is seduction, basically. And to seduce Hollywood producers, I mean, they're easy marks compared to some of the people that the CIA has to go after. According to internal CIA documents, the movie's producers were given exclusive access to the CIA version of history. And again, as they pointed out in that short clip of the trailer, they got unprecedented access and close working with the CIA. We saw this happen with the interview when the emails from Sony were leaked. We saw that they were working very closely with the State Department, with the RAND Corporation, to put out a narrative that the leader of North Korea needed to be assassinated, knowing that the movie would eventually find its way with bootleg copies into North Korea, set that up. They use Hollywood, they use the media as propaganda. It's a continuous stream of propaganda coming from them, whether it's ham-fisted or whether it's subtle like it is in the interview. One of the things, however, that they talk about in the Frontline special, they kind of put it as a uh, fight between the Senate and between Dianne Feinstein, with her being the hero exposing all this. Quite frankly, that really didn't happen. That itself is a head fake, trying to make you think that there is some real oversight of the CIA. No, they get away with murder, and the Senate lets them do it. Of course, the current Senate intelligence head, Richard Burr, the Republican who took her place, is going to be far more in the pocket of the CIA than even Dianne Feinstein. Now, one of the things that you should think about and is a way that you can get other people to care about the surveillance, care about the secret CIA torture state that we're developing here, the police state that is being put into place here in America. There are some pranksters who are doing just that in New York. They have some uh, anti-NSA pranksters that contacted Wired Magazine and told them what they were doing in New York, essentially setting up tape recorders in public and recording people's conversations. The prankster provocateurs describe and document the videos on their website, and it involves planting micro cassette recorders under tables and benches around New York City, retrieving the tapes, and then embedding the resulting audio on their website, wearealwayslistening.com. Because, you know, quite frankly, if you aren't doing anything wrong, you don't have anything to hide, right? We don't need to worry about privacy anymore in America. 
I think it's a brilliant strategy. And of course, some of the conversations that they've put up there already, although they don't identify people, they say that uh, they do say where this was recorded. So people can put things together. We hear people that are talking about uh, financial matters, talking about jobs and relationships, even sexual fetishes. But of course, we shouldn't worry about any of that because you know the NSA is vacuuming up everything on everyone and then data mining it to see how they can use if you're somebody that they want to focus on. This is what the people at wearealwayslistening.com said. They said, we've started with New York City as a pilot program, but we hope to roll out the initiative all across the homeland, quote unquote. Citizens don't seem to mind this monitoring, so we're hiding recorders in public places in hopes of gathering information that will help with the war on terror. They say the project's creators have chosen to remain anonymous to avoid law, uh, legal challenges in uh, New York law because you need to have uh, permission, at least one party, to record somebody else, and they're not getting anybody's permission. They say the uh, NSA, however, employs many third-party contracts, contractors, and we consider ourselves to be contractors of this nature, albeit unpaid and unsanctioned. And I guess one of the questions is, if people are worried about the legal issues of this particular project to wake people up, Maybe we should be worried about the legal issues of the NSA not getting either party's permission when they record our conversations, when they store our conversations, and again, like I said, when they data analyze our conversations. Stay with us when we come back. We're going to talk about the latest giant bank robbery from the banksters. It looks like they're rigging every single market you can think of and, of course, getting away with it. We'll be right back with the details. Still I, again, again, we no. were misled that there were supposedly protests and then something sprang out of that, an assault sprang out of that. And that was easily ascertained I, that that was not the fact. But, but, and the American know, people could have known that within days, and, and they, they didn't know that. With all due respect, the fact is we had four dead Americans. Was it I because understand. of a protest or was it because of guys out for a walk one night who decided they'd go kill some Americans? What difference at this point does it make? Just when she thought it was safe to dip her toe back into the hearts and minds of America, Benghazi documentation chains her yet again to another lie to the American people, stating that without a shadow of a doubt, she knew and the Pentagon knew Benghazi was planned 10 days in advance. Good luck escaping that bombshell, Hillary. Drunk on power and the promise of secretive backdoor deals dangled in front of you by the global banking syndicate you truly answer to. What difference at this point does it make? Her husband's chickens have now come home to roost, and not only will she be defending all of her lies, Hillary Clinton's platform calls for a reformation of her spouse's policies. Bill Clinton signed the 1994 Violent Crime Control Law and Law Enforcement Act. Harsher sentencing laws followed as states were given fiscal incentives to implement them. One in 15 African American men are incarcerated, yet African Americans only make up about 13% of the U.S. population. The incarceration rates have skyrocketed by 500% in just 30 years. The $80 billion a year prison industrial complex has thrown people behind bars for five to 10 years on first time drug offenses. In other developed countries, sentences average out to be around six months, probation, or no jail time at all. According to California Prison Focus, no other society in human history has imprisoned so many of its own citizens. The prison industrial complex is one of the fastest growing industries in the United States. This multi-million dollar industry has its own trade exhibitions, conventions, websites, and mail order internet catalogs. It also has direct advertising campaigns, architecture companies, construction companies, investment houses on Wall Street, plumbing supply companies, food supply companies, armed security and padded cells, and a large variety of colors. According to the Left Business Observer, the federal prison industry produces 100% of all military helmets, ammunition belts, bulletproof vests, ID tags, shirts, pants, tents, bags, and canteens. Prison workers supply 98% of the entire market for equipment assembly services, 93% of paints and paintbrushes, 92% of stove assembly, 46% of body armor, 36% of home appliances, 30% of headphones, microphones, and speakers, and 21% of office furniture airplane parts, medical supplies, and much more. Prisoners are even raising seeing-eye dogs for blind people. 
Thanks to prison labor, the United States is once again an attractive location for investment and work that was designed for third world labor markets. A company that operated an assembly plant in Mexico near the border closed down its operations and relocated to San Quentin State Prison in California. In Texas, a factory fired its 150 workers and contracted the services of prison workers from the private Lockhart, Texas prison, where circuit boards are assembled for companies like IBM and Compaq. And that's just a small sample of the damage her husband did. With all of her corporate ties, lies, and questionable alibis, are we really supposed to believe Hillary Clinton has America's best interests in mind? John Bound, Infowars.com. Today we see that five of the world's largest banks have been hit with record fines. But don't worry, it really isn't that much. And we'll see what the results of that are in just a moment. They've been caught fixing the currency market. You know, there was a LIBOR scandal, there's been the uh, interest rate scandals, there have been money laundering scandals, and of course there's been fixing of the precious metals market, many other markets that they have rigged. But now, in this particular one, we've got five of the world's largest banks will pay fines just under $6 billion for manipulating foreign currency exchanges. Those banks are J.P. Morgan, Barclays, Citigroup, and RBS. They pled guilty to U.S. criminal charges. The fifth bank, UBS, a Swiss bank, will plead guilty to rigging benchmark interest rates. And, of course, this relates back to the LIBOR scandal. If you don't remember what LIBOR is, that is the basis for setting interest rates for home loans, for consumer loans, for business loans. If you've got a variable rate mortgage, that's the way they adjust your variable rate mortgage. Of course, they were playing these spreads and they've been caught playing that. And in this particular case, UBS was singled out for different treatment because they already reached a negotiated settlement just 10 months ago. They paid a small fine and they promised not to do it anymore and they went back and did it again. Sounds very much like HSBC's money laundering for terrorists and drug cartels, doesn't it? They were put on super secret probation. They did it again. But of course, the Justice Department said it doesn't serve anybody's interest to send any of these bankers to prison, prompting many people to say, of course, they're too big to jail, just like they're too big to fail. Barclays is also sacking eight employees. I guess that's really tough. They actually fired a few of these people. That's a first. Nobody ever goes to jail, but now we've had eight employees that get fired. Now, this is what they were doing for five years from 2007, currency traders used a private electronic chat room to manipulate exchange rates. Between 2008 and 2012, several traders formed a cartel, and they used chat rooms to manipulate prices in their favor. Now, here's some of the other markets that they have manipulated. Barclays is also being investigated in the UK over its Qatari fundraising during the financial crisis. Remember that financial crisis when we bailed them out? And in America, over operation of a dark pool electronic trading business. In addition to that, there's also investigations going into them manipulating the energy markets in California and the gold and precious metal markets in the United States. And one person here says, well, it looks like the major global banks are going to face many more, quote, we deeply regret this behavior, unquote, days ahead. In other words, mistakes were made. We really regret it, but of course, nobody's going to pay for it. Now, here's the kicker. Even though they got record fines, we can see that the stock shares actually went up today because these fines were not nearly uh, that big. They're not really going to impact them whatsoever. They're not punitive fines by any means whatsoever. They say the fines are much lower than expected. So we see that Barclays went up 3.4%, RBS rose 1.8% in one day. So the market is ecstatic. They got away with the crimes. They say no retroactive massive LIBOR fine for Barclays either. That's a big positive. Take a look at what this LIBOR scandal looks like. Pull up this graphic here, and you can see this is mapped out by the Wall Street Journal. And as you roll over it, it's an inter interactive map, and as you roll over it, you can see the different names. And look at that tangled web of conspiracy. Oh, that's the conspiracy word, isn't it? You know, that's when one or more people get together and plot to do something illegal. The banks are the biggest conspirators in the world and they consistently get away with it. Now, 
I also thought it was very ironic that at the same time this is being released, about $6 billion worth of fines for these five banks for rigging interest rate markets, among other things, everybody was on pins and needles waiting to see what the minutes were going to say from the latest Federal Reserve meetings, whether or not they were going to manipulate interest rates just like these banks are doing. So these banks can do it. And when they uh, send money to drug cartels, to terrorist groups, they get a small slap on the wrist. Nobody goes to jail. The small guys are consistently having their life savings confiscated in the name of civil asset forfeiture, even though they're not even engaged in a crime, just because they're quote unquote structuring deposits, not depositing, filling out the paperwork properly for the banks. They get their entire life savings confiscated. The large banks pay a very small fine. And then the Federal Reserve, the private central bank that is manipulating openly the economy, everybody just hangs on pins and needles to see if they're going to raise interest rates. Of course, they're not going to raise interest rates. They were, and they said that in these minutes. We've seen over and over again how the central banks around the world are wringing their hands and saying, the economies are dead. Nothing is bringing them back. Quantitative easing isn't working. Zero interest rates aren't working. We're going to have to force people to take away any remaining savings that they've got and spend them using negative interest rates. And oh, by the way, we can also then outlaw cash at the same time. Stay with us. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about what happened today with the Trans-Pacific Partnership Fast Track Movement and also what's going on with these tracking devices that some people are saying shutting down their cars very dangerously as they're driving down the highway or frying their electronics. Staying with us, we'll be right back. This is the week that the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, has said they're going to pass the TPP fast track process. Of course, it's not just for TPP. It's for TTIP and any other trade agreement that comes up in the next six years. Last week, there was a filibuster that was shut down, and Mitch McConnell said it was going to pass this week. It will allow them in the fast track process to pass this secret agreement that's been crafted over many years. It will allow them to pass that with just 51 votes instead of 67 by not calling it a treaty, among other things. And of course, there will be no amendments allowed to that secretly negotiated agreement. Now we see today that Mitch McConnell is not going to allow any debate on passing the Trade Promotion Authority. U.S. Senate leader moves to limit debate on fast-track trade bill. Mitch McConnell took procedural steps aimed at bringing a debate on a fast-track bill to a close, moving the controversial bill a step closer to a vote on passage. He says, it's my hope that we could, would also be able to process a number of amendments and then move forward and we'll have a couple of days to accomplish that. They'll do that by shutting down the debate. In other words, no amendments, no talking about it, just shut up and sign it. Here's the agreement. We should all be very concerned about how not only uh, commerce and uh, industry are being controlled by this, jobs are being given away. We should also be concerned, as we pointed out many times, about sovereignty issues. Take a look at what's going on with the internet. We now see that the FCC, after fighting to get control of the internet, is now anxious to turn it over to as an unyet identified international body for additional points of control. As the New American points out today, it's been a few bad weeks for freedom where the internet's concerned. First came the news of the FCC reclassifying the internet as a public utility. Now the same federal government wants to regulate the way the internet service providers, ISPs, deliver content to their subscribers. They're planning to hand control of assigning IP addresses to domain names over to an international body made up of governments and international organizations. And we don't know what this body is going to be yet. Isn't it interesting? that they fought so hard for control only to turn it over to some unknown international body that we will soon, I guess, find out about that. Now, one of the things that is troubling about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, besides what I just mentioned, is the changes in copyright and patents. We understand that these multinational corporations are not only elevating themselves to the level of states, but they are also, with these new copyright laws, going to try to assert ownership over everything. 
We've talked in the past about how they are maintaining, even going back to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, maintaining that the software that is so intricately linked in with the electronic control of your cars, with tractors and so forth, remain the property of John Deere or General Motors and that you don't really own your car. You just have an implied license. You didn't buy anything. Well, now we see another aspect of this. And of course, Progressive Insurance has been offering up to a 30% discount if you would allow them to track your driving, to monitor and record it and report it back to them. Electronic plugs to monitor your driving for insurance discounts has resulted in over 8,000 customer complaints and over $580,000 in claim payouts from Progressive Insurance alone. Consumers allege that the monitoring device suddenly shut their cars off while driving, causing them to lose power steering and braking. Others claimed it fried their car's electronics. One insurance company has shut down their monitor plug-in program. It was ironically named My Safety Valet. Will knowing that you're being tracked by the insurance company cause you to drive differently? Red light cameras affect driver behavior. An investigation in LA showed red light cameras tripled the number of accidents. Bear in mind, this week we've had the biggest recall in history. 34 million vehicles with defective airbags that explode unexpectedly and hurl metal in your face. As automakers, insurance companies, and government race full speed to track us, tax us, and take away our steering wheels, it's time to put the brakes on. This is David Knight reporting for Infowars.com. And again, Progressive denies that there was any fault of their own. Nevertheless, they paid out. $582,000 in claims, and other insurance companies have removed their program to put that device into your diagnostic port. I think it illustrates how we're going to see this breakdown. I think the first generations of these self-driving cars with the electronics may not be as bad as the subsequent generations. Once they start adding additional functionality, think about how your phone, when you update your older phone to a newer version of iOS, what happens? We may see some real physical crashes instead of just software crashes. But of course, this is fundamentally about tracking and taxing you. How can the corporations make more money from you? How can the government control you better? We can see this breaking down now. This has been coming on for a long time. Now, Oregon is getting ready to test pay per mile. They say they're going to offer this as an alternative to paying a gas tax. Now, the interesting thing about this, they say this is the first in the nation program that would charge car owners not for the fuel they use, but for the miles that they drive. They say the money generated from gas taxes is declining because of greater fuel efficiency and the increasing popularity of fuel-efficient hybrid and electric cars. Therefore, they have to start charging you by mile. But if you look at this program, the program is voluntary. So why would anybody that has a high-mileage car volunteer to be taxed by the mile? Of course, it's going to be the people who are going to be would have been paying higher taxes at the pump so it's going to be a net loss for them they will not make it voluntary in the long run in the long run you will get both of these and in the long run it's just another way that they're going to use to track and control your every movement and make the corporations that run this government even richer well that's it for tonight's news if you're watching this on youtube please subscribe to our channel if you would like to get it a day earlier as the news is being released you can subscribe to Prison Planet TV and, of course, also help to support our operation here. Your subscription can be shared with 20 people at the same time, and you can also share all of Alex Jones's documentaries at the same time you support our operation. Again, join us tomorrow night at 7 Central.